Some tips for this lab include using the same type of can. Imagine if you were to use a pop can and a tin can uh, from students in different areas across the room. Their data is going to be a little bit different. And why? Is because that for two reasons. A, that metal can, is the first thing that's going to conduct that heat from the fuel source. And secondly, it's going to have different surface areas and so therefore the temperature probe is going to be in have more or less water within it. So a bigger can, the sensor will be in less water. That will influence the amount of heat um, that is available to the, to the temperature probe. We also don't want the sensor to touch the side of the water. When you're measuring calorimetry, you're measuring, is, you're measuring energy that is converted. Um, so uh, like a calorie is changing one gram of water one degree centigrade. Now, while students are not going back in and breaking down the, the energy per volume within Clean Smoke Lab, they will later within Ag Power and Technology in 516, and they will also do that within an Animal Science um, in 531, Energy and Feed. So this is a lab skill that we can build up upon by making sure that we keep that consistent. It is also suggested that within wide cans, you double the water content to 200 uh, grams rather than 100 grams. Now, ethanol, we did uh, discuss earlier as a volatile fuel. Uh, it is suggested that you purchase new fuel each year. Um, same thing with the fossil fuels. You'll, you'll get more accurate results that way. Also, take a look at the specs within the lab. If, later, we'll show some pictures of differences of wick length. Uh, you want to have the same wick length of that of that rope. Otherwise, you're changing the amount of fuel that is available uh, to the flame. You also have consistent distance from the can to the wick, and the sensor should be one eighth of an inch away from the bottom of the can. Students should have some similarities within the results. If we take away the specific numbers, you can see that there will be here are the trends. For heat, kerosene should be a, a higher burning fuel. Uh, however, the emissions of the ethanol will be extremely clean, uh, clean uh, compared to kerosene, which will have a lot of uh, carbon outputs. Uh, the flame for ethanol will be a a uh, clear flame which uh, with a blue tip or kerosene will have a longer orange flame. And the drops for the sodium hydroxide, which shows the uh, carbon dioxide emissions. For ethanol, you'll need one to two drops. Kerosene, you'll need two to four drops. Um, the point to this is that kerosene does put off more carb uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so the trade-offs for this is that ethanol is cleaner burning, kerosene is more efficient, but ethanol provides renewable fuel that is cleaner for the environment and decreases dependency on foreign oil. It also should be noted that kerosene is not always, does not always have a complete combustion. And so therefore, if it creates more carbon dioxide in a complete conduction, uh, combustion, how much carbon monoxide is it producing? This is something that students should take in consideration, but there is no LabQuest sensor that is currently available to measure carbon monoxide. On the left, you'll see the ethanol can uh, after this lab. The ethanol can was very clean on the side and left a little bit of, of soot on the bottom. The kerosene can on the, so on the other hand um, had a lot more... Uh, carbon soot on the on the bottoms and on on the sides it should be noted within the write-up for this lab that students trade off one group will start with ethanol and the other group will start uh, with kerosene and then they'll trade uh, so it's great to have students make initial observations off of the cleanliness of the cans uh, across the room imagine if each lab station had this the same the same can um, that would allow you to have some very consistent results for there.
fuel does produce carbon dioxide. Um, in this lab, students will collect carbon dioxide emissions in a bottle, um, and they will prove its presence through a titration lab. Uh, so just as pictured, you'll see the student keeping uh, this plastic bottle secure over uh, to the pla uh, end of the metal cap. Uh, the and they're going to keep it there until the fuel extinguishes itself, meaning when it's out, runs out of the oxygen that is available within that bottle, it's going to uh, put itself out. At that point, the student will pull the bottle up quickly, and you need to cap it. It's very important that you keep it vertical and cap it quickly um, so you don't lose any of the carbon dioxide. Know, know that carbon dioxide is is a heavy fuel um, so uh, or is a heavy gas so therefore when you pull it up it's naturally going to want to um, it's going to be more dense in the atmosphere around it so it's going to want to sink a little bit so get that cap on as quickly as possible uh, next is you're going to add in the water with the btb to solution when the btb solution is blue it means it's an alkaline solution yellow is acidic when carbon dioxide is is diffused within water it does become acidic and so by turning that solution yellow you're proving that there's carbon dioxide within that bottle provided are some pictures of the btb solution uh, from the clean smoke lab on the left, we have the ethanol and the kerosene in their respective uh, solutions. You'll see that they're a little yellow in tint. The kerosene is a little darkish because of the carbon uh, uh, soot that was also found within the bottle. So I recommend, it, if you can, uh, doing the, the ethanol portion first before the kerosene if you're having to use the same bottle just because of that. Uh, Next, uh, students would drop in the sodium hydroxide. It is very important to note that your drop size need to be very consistent. So in case world, we really try to teach students that we hold that bottle uh, perpendicular to the ground so that way the drops are the correct size and they're consistent in size. Um, also, you only want to do one drop at a time. In the kerosene, you probably notice that it's a lot darker shade of blue. Part of that is the soot, part of that is it has probably an extra drop than what was really needed. Um, so what is suggested is to put in a drop. You'll probably see a hint of blue in a localized area. Pick up that 30 mil cup, swirl it around. If the blue doesn't stay, add in another drop. How can we skew the results within this lab? First is wick length. We talked about wick length earlier, and it that wick of the length determines the fuel available to the flame. So keeping those consistent is key. Next is making sure that you compare the data only within the same types of cans. If you have cans of different surface area or different types of metals, it's going to drastically throw off the uh, your results and how you're able to compare. And this graph is an example of skewed results. The red line is ethanol. The green line is kerosene. But the blue line is kerosene where the wick was longer. You notice it only took 150 seconds, about 150 seconds, to get it to boiling point. Uh, whereas uh, the kerosene that had a more consistent uh, wick length with the ethanol did it still burn more or burn uh, higher yes but we had only one variable and that was the fuel when the wick length was longer we had two different variables and therefore the data was void If you were provided a go link from the Kansas Corn Commission there are a few modifications for this lab since the lab itself is wrote for a uh, lab quest too. First, is the go link only allows one sensor to be directly plugged into the go link, uh, which the go link plugs into the USB port, as shown in this picture. Uh, you have to download Logger Pro from the Veneer website, and you have to get a login to do that. The login's free, and Logger Pro is free as well. Uh, but you just had to have a, a login to be able to do that.
so it's fairly simple. You connect the temperature sensor directly into the GoLink and the GoLink into the computer. While this is a cheaper source, it does have some limitations that uh, might hinder you in other labs. For instance, uh, any veneer sensors that plug into a digital uh, port will not be able to be used with a GoLink. Moreover, GoLink can only use one sensor at a time. The Kansas Corn Commission thanks you for watching this video. If you need any materials to implement this lab in your classroom, please visit the Kansas Corn Commission's website, click on Educators, and request materials. We also encourage you to participate in Seed to STEM to be able to connect Kansas corn production to your ag classroom.